Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. I want to talk about saturated fat and brain health. Now, this is a critical topic. There's been so much data I've been seeing. Well, I should back that up. Not data, but I've been seeing discussions or thoughts, theories that a higher amount of saturated fat intake will somehow make your brain stronger. And there's two versions of this message. One says that in the moment you're more mentally sharp and alert when you consume saturated fat. And that one, pretty tough to argue with, not much data either way. And short-term effects can be easy to be skewed or have biases. But the one I want to talk about the most is about the long-term effects upon brain health. You know, a lot of things you can do, you could say, sure, I eat X and I feel better, therefore X is good. Reasonable enough. But a difficulty is that many of our decisions are affecting our health long term, you know, decades down the road. We don't know what we're doing in the moment, how that plays out down the road without looking at other, other data. You know, we only get one shot at growing old and having a good brain. We can't try it 10 times and then hit reset and try it again. So we've got to rely upon evidence. We can't rely upon our intuitions or our judgment in the moment. And many who've been encouraging saturated fat for brain health have also been claiming that it will help your brain offset the risk of brain aging. So there's been a couple of papers I pulled through recently and I just wanted to go through some of the claims and then go through what we know about this thing, what we really know on this topic. I think you'll be kind of shocked. Now, a few points I wanna preface this, this with. A really important one is that all evidence is not created equally. And we know this intuitively. You know, say you've got two friends and you're, you wanna drive across town and you wanna go from, you're catching a plane you know, I was in this scenario, I can think about it. I was at a friend's home and I had to get to an airport in, a, in Chicago and I, I don't live there. And one friend said, oh, you know, I bet that this road, this road is open. It looks like it connects on the map. It would probably work. And another friend said, hey, I just made that drive last week, like many times. And that road ends up taking so much longer. There's often construction or delays you wouldn't expect. So who do you listen to? Do you listen to someone who's got an idea about what would work? Or do you listen to someone who's got actual experience, who's actually done that? And the contrast that I'm drawing about is really about ideas or models versus experiments. <laughs> you know, this person didn't experiment. They actually made the drive to the airport and they knew results from that. And so too with medical science, we've got two very different kinds of information. One is more conceptual based. It's more, this should work because of this model or this understanding. So the main model about saturated fats being good for the brain, the argument really goes that, hey, your brain is made of saturated fats, therefore saturated fats must help it. And that, that's the argument. So that's kind of like, hey, I think this would be a good way to go because of the map or because of this idea. Now, the other kind of data is based upon actual evidence, actual experimentation. And in terms of humans, we don't have a lot of data in terms of interventional studies. What that means is there's not a lot of examples of people who have been intentionally put in two different groups and then watched over decades and decades. But there is a lot of data about watching populations, cohort studies. We can look back on the facts and say, hey, if this group of 50,000 people had an unusually low rate of dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, and they had a diet that had a very low amount of saturated fats, that's an argument towards that being a good variable for that outcome. Now the limit about studies like that is always other variables could have been relevant. You know, many times researchers do a good job factoring out things like smoking status or exercise or genetic risks or whatnot, but you can't change every single variable. You know, and so too with your friends in the airport instructions, the one that just took that trip, you know, maybe he was there on a bad day. And perhaps there was even other scenarios in which someone was a professional taxi driver or Uber driver and they made the trip daily. You know, that's higher and higher data, higher evidence. So you want to rely upon outcomes, not ideas. This, this bothers me because you can have very elegant, very logical, very easy to remember ideas about what should happen in the body and they can just be wrong. <laughs> you know, we see this in all sciences and economics. You can have the more simple a concept is, we're often drawn into it, thinking that it's got to be right because it has such elegance or, or good symmetry, so to speak. But really, experiments matter. So 
it's like a card game to where one person could say, hey, I've got a great hand, I've got these two kings. And someone else could say, well, that's pretty cool, I've got three twos, I win. <laughs> and it's the same case with evidence. And there's been very formal systems ranking levels of evidence. And the idea of expert consensus or hypothesis based upon models or based upon in vivo studies, uh, in, in vitro studies, I should say, that's a very low type of evidence. That's evidence based upon findings in a test tube, not a finding in a real person. And the drawback about that is it can be just completely opposite of what outcomes are in the real world, in animal studies or better yet, from people studies. So that's one thing I want to preface this discussion with. Another thing I want to preface the discussion with is that there's different ways that your body uses nutrients. And some, some nutrients, we have to have them. You know, we, we need certain things for reactions to occur. And so we categorize them in these different groups. There's some nutrients that we need for the body to do something, but we actually make that stuff. Uh, and even lower than that could be things that are just not even essential. So let's talk about your brain, for example. So arguably, uh, monounsaturated oleic acid is non-essential to the formation of brain cells. You just don't need it. It's not even relevant. So that's the bottom of the scale of being critical. Now, the next step up is something that you do need, but you can make whenever you need it. So think about that like you're having a party, for example, and you need some ice to put in the wine glasses. Well, you've got an ice machine. Well, you don't put ice in wine glasses. I'm not a big drinker. <laughs> but you've got an ice machine. So you need ice, but your refrigerator makes it whenever you need it. So you don't have to go to the store for ice. It's essential, but it's not something you've got to go and acquire from outside of you. And some nutrients are like that. And that's the case with saturated fats and brain health. You do need saturated fats, but you can make them when you need them. And in fact, you can make them quite readily. The other factor with many non-essential nutrients is that they may be found in the diet, but when they're non-essential, ingesting them doesn't have a big effect upon synthesis of them. So let's go back to ice, for example. You know, you could go buy some ice, but that doesn't put more ice in your ice, it doesn't make your ice maker go faster because <laughs> it's already doing its own thing internally. The same thing is true for glycine and collagen synthesis, for example. We need glycine to make collagen, to make new connective tissue, but glycine is a non-essential amino acid, meaning we can make it whenever we need it. The other category of nutrients are essential, and they are things we have to get from outside of us in some circumstances. But in other circumstances, the more common ones, we can make them. So we call these conditionally essential. One example here would be carnitine. So carnitine is a compound, it's a modified amino acid. We need that for bringing fats into the mitochondria for fuel in the body. And in almost all cases, we make it whenever we need it. And taking more carnitine doesn't really make that reaction of burning fat go any faster. Now, there are some examples to where people cannot make carnitine due to gene variation or other disease process. And in those cases, their capacity to burn fat, it's inhibited by that lack of carnitine. And if they supplement with carnitine, they can be back up to a baseline level of fat burning. But you can't take carnitine and have your fat burning go through the roof. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so the next step would be essential nutrients. These are things you need for a reaction to, to occur, and you cannot make them. So vitamin C is a great example in terms of back to collagen synthesis. So for humans, we need vitamin C to build collagen, and we cannot synthesize vitamin C. There's one small chemical step to go from glucose to vitamin C, and pretty much all mammals, with a few exceptions, can make it. We can't. So if we lack vitamin C, again, here's our collagen formation. If we lack vitamin C, our collagen formation is compromised and we get scurvy. We get bleeding gums and teeth fall out and joints get all sore, skin gets nasty because we can't build collagen. So if we consume vitamin C from our diets, we can make collagen normally. But if we do a mega dose of vitamin C, that doesn't mean we make collagen faster. Now the last category, this is a self-sufficient nutrient. And what this means is that it's a nutrient you need to carry on a reaction and the more of this nutrient you have, the faster the reaction occurs. There's actually not that many examples of this, but I think that many people believe that all nutrients work in this way. 
So let's give an example. One of the best ones I can think about would be iodine for thyroid function. So you need a certain amount of iodine for your thyroid to make hormones. And when iodine is deficient, that production rate is slow and it's compromised. So when you've got enough iodine, you make enough thyroid hormone. Here's a wrinkle. If you have a mega dose of iodine, your gland would make extra hormone and it starts to, but then you blow a fuse. And that fuse is called the Wolf-Chaikoff effect. And the few examples to where nutrients control the rate of a process, there's almost always a built-in safety switch, so you don't do too much of that. And that safety switch is also helpful because if you've got a bit less of that nutrient than is ideal, you can still adjust to a point and carry on that reaction properly. I think that those who feel that saturated fat would make you smarter, I think they, they misunderstand and think that saturated fat is an, an adequate essential nutrient. That once you've got it, your brain just makes more and more cells and works faster and faster. And it's not. It's actually a non-essential endogenous compound. So we do use it for building brain cells, but we make it all day long, whenever we need it, and we make it inside the brain. And even further along than that, there's not a large correlation between saturated fat in the bloodstream and then having adequate saturated fat in the brain. So, so let's go to the studies. Well, one of the papers that I saw just blew me away. They argued that higher saturated fat in the diet reduced risk of dementia by 36%. So I read the study that was cited. I went to the actual study they're referring to. And it pretty much baffled me because they never even used the number 36 anywhere. I'll tell you, I cheated. I pulled up the whole study and I just did a, a search for that whole page for the number 36. I'm just gonna find right to where they were talking about. And I didn't find anything. It didn't, it didn't exist. But the study did talk about the relationship between Alzheimer's disease, cognitive decline, and saturated fat. And what the statement, what the paper actually said was that one of the largest bodies of evidence was that a diet high in saturated fat and low in vegetables was a big predictor for Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline. So not only do they not say that having saturated fat would cut your dementia risk by 36%, they said that saturated fat was one of the best documented risks for causing dementia. So it blew me away. The conclusion that the writer said was the exact opposite of the conclusion of the article that was cited in that. Another paper I saw said that you need saturated fat to keep your brain cells insulated. Your brain is made up of saturated fat and cholesterol, and if you eat too few of those things, it can make your brain work badly because you're starving it of one of its main fuels, its main component. Now, in the study itself, they, um, they talked about, there was, this was also cited a different study, and in the study that they cited, they said that brain, brain cholesterol, brain saturated fat as well, is synthesized in C2 by astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. Whole lot of funny words. What it means is that your brain cells build saturated fat whenever they want to. The researchers also said that the, the pool of cholesterol in the brain is completely isolated from the pools of cholesterol in the rest of your body. Not only that, they even argued that the way you make cholesterol in your brain, the kind that you make inside your brain, is a little bit different than the kind you make in the rest of your body based upon the apolipoprotein subtypes. So what this means is that your consumption of cholesterol and saturated fat doesn't really affect your brain's level of cholesterol or saturated fat. And even further than that, your consumption of cholesterol is not the largest needle mover about your whole body's level of cholesterol. There's a thing called the blood-brain barrier. There's basically a big, I don't know, like a big port of entry that your brain has. And a lot of things that are floating around in your bloodstream are not allowed into your brain and vice versa. So it's a separate environment that's critical. So if you're not consuming butter, cholesterol, saturated fat, that doesn't mean your brain runs out of it. That's not where your brain gets those things from. It gets it by making it internally. You know, another paper I saw was arguing that individuals who consume more of saturated fat have dramatic risk reductions, and they cited a study as well. I read this study too, and in fact, in this one, they said there was no trend that saturated fat reduced risk. No relationship, no clear trend. It was not significant relationship. So I'm, I'm left really puzzled. <laughs> I'm not sure where, where this idea comes from, but I've seen this trend before to where 
we get we get ideas, we get fads, we want to run with them, and we just someone will search a study that has saturated fat, brain health, and then just cite that study without really reading through it closely or seeing what they actually said. And even some say that our diet should be made up more than half of saturated fat. So what does the actual science tell us? Well, there's different types of information, but back to that whole poker game thing, <laughs> if we think about like the royal flush, like if we take the meta analysis, so the best quality human studies that are then put together in terms of one large study and look at all evidence, not just like this study or that study, but all the ones asking that question, what are the results they're seeing as a group? And overall, there's, there's a very strong trend, very consistent trend, that the more you consume saturated fats, like trans fatty acids or other saturated fats, the greater we see risk for cognitive decline, the greater we see risk for dementia, the greater we see risk for Alzheimer's disease. The exact relationship between saturated fat and Alzheimer's has been looked at by four studies. Another four studies looked at mild cognitive impairment in saturated fat, and four more looked at, at cognitive decline in saturated fat intake. Not a single one of those studies showed that saturated fat was good for your brain. There was not one of them that said, hey, people that drank butter in their coffee did better when they aged. None of them suggested anything like that. In fact, nearly all of them showed that saturated fats worsen the risk of Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, and cognitive decline. And then we think about total longevity. So that's always the trump card, you know, total longevity, because I don't know, even if your brain's working a little better, but you die early, that may not be a helpful outcome. And to date, the largest study on total intake of saturated fat and mortality showed that every 5% increase of saturated fat leads to an 8% increase in total mortality from diseases like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, and even cancer. So it's true that many parts of your body do use saturated fat and cholesterol, but these are not essential fats. These are not fats that you have to consume from your diet. And one of the strongest, strongest things we see in nutrition is that we need nutrients, and at some point, empty calories become a liability. You know, if your diet's good, bad, or sideways, if you've got three times the calorie load you need, there's going to be bad things that happen to you in terms of weight gain, diabetes, cancer risks, early aging. And on the other side, if you're lacking essential nutrients, there's other bad things that happen to you that are the same. So the game is to get the nutrients with as few calories as possible. And that's why we talk about foods like sugar, white flour, as being bad foods because they're by and large empty calories. There's no essential nutrients. And the exact same thing is true for saturated fats. So butter, lards, animal fats, they are empty calories. There's no essential nutrients in there that our bodies cannot make. And what you're doing is you're taking in a lot of calories and you're basically displacing calories that could have given you some essential nutrients. <laughs> so, in summary, they're not, saturated fats are not a health food. There's no good evidence suggesting they'll protect your brain or help it work better. Dr. Christensen here. I really wanted to share that message because I want to be smart when I'm old, <laughs> stay smart, and you know, have a good functioning brain. I want you to as well. And it's difficult because what we do today doesn't yield obvious effects today. It's only by looking at models that we can know what's going to happen decades down the road. So let's stay sharp and, and have a fun old age decades down the road. <laughs> Take great care of yourselves. We'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.